people need to hear an authentic witness, an authentic telling of God's presence in our lives today. Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. Peter Herbeck's with me today, and we're really happy because we have a special guest by video who is from Canada, and our Canadian brothers and sisters are just so inspiring to us each year. We have the Lift Jesus Higher Rally in Toronto, but we have some real friends there in an organization called Catholic Christian Outreach, which is devoted to evangelizing university students, and they, they're on campus all over Canada. And our guest today by video is a member of Catholic Christian Outreach who used to do evangelization on campuses and now she's working in parishes, Christy Dupuy. Yeah, we've known Catholic Christian Outreach for a long time, Andre Renier and his team. And uh, it's one of the great signs, I think, of what the Lord is doing to uh, renew the missionary heart and the missionary vision of the church in Canada, like Focus is here in the United States mm -hmm. and organizations like that. There's, they've, they've really discipled many young people over the years and they're actually doing it. You know, they're on, the, they're on the campuses, they're reaching out to students and they're really bringing students to faith, but not just bringing them to faith, but really helping them walk and become disciples of Jesus. What does it mean to surrender your life to Christ? What does it mean to live in a way that pleases him? And, yeah. and they're good at it. And they're, yeah. it's, it's been a joy to work with them over the years. Yeah, and each year our friend Mickey Dopp, who has a tremendous outreach and evangelization, has a big conference in Ottawa that he, by internet kind of distributes all over the world. And Sister Ann Shields was speaking at it last year and she came back saying, you gotta hear Christy Dupuy. She was really good, you gotta have her on the program. She actually agreed to be on the program, but she's expecting her fourth baby right now. Okay. And so we have her by video. Good. So, like Josh said, when I was in university, uh, I had the opportunity to attend this retreat. Now, when I went to this retreat, I was not practicing my Catholic faith. I wasn't even really praying. I didn't even really know if God existed. But as I was on my way to this retreat, which my mom dragged me to, uh, I remember looking out the window of this bus and thinking, okay, God, if you are really, really real, just open my heart to whatever you have in store for me. It's a pretty strange prayer for someone who hadn't been praying. And as I walked into this retreat, I saw hundreds of young people who were excited about their faith. And for the first time, I heard the gospel explained to me in a clear, simple, and relevant way. And that evening, I had the opportunity to go to Eucharistic Adoration for the first time in my life. I'd been Catholic since birth. I'd never been to Eucharistic Adoration. And as they brought the monstrance out and had Jesus exposed before us, and I didn't know, I didn't know what the Eucharist was, but as I gazed at him, there was something in me. And I know now, looking back, that this was a great grace that God gave to me. But I looked at Jesus on the altar and something deep within me knew, knew that he had given everything for me. That he had given his life for me. And in that same moment that I'm realizing this radical love that he had for me, there was something stirring in my heart. There was this 
just this desire that welled up in me. And I thought, he gave me everything. How can I not give everything back to him? How can I not give everything back to him? And so for the past about 15 years, I can't believe I can say that. Am I old enough to say that? <laughs> George Weigel told me yesterday I look 18, so I'm going to just hang on to that. But I really do have about 15 years of experience of being a missionary. You know, and George spoke last night about how mission territory, it's here and now. It's here and now. We don't have to go to crazy places. And I can tell you, I'm a wife, and I am a mother, and I am a missionary of the kitchen tables. <laughs> I am a missionary in my schools, and I am a missionary in my parish. That is where I minister. That is where I have been seeking to reach out to people, to communicate the love of God to them, to help them learn how to live that out, how to live that out, and then in turn how they can go forth and share Christ with others. That is what I do as a missionary. So today I want to share with you some of the lessons I've learned, some of the principles I feel that my missionary work really flows out of. So the first thing I want to talk to you about this morning is just the power of our story, of our testimony. I believe our stories are one of the most powerful tools that we have as missionaries. We all know the story of the apostles, right? We listen to that story when Jesus says, come, follow me. And they literally drop everything. They drop their nets. I love how Sherry Waddell, she calls it that. The drop the net moment. Right? At some point in our lives, we've all made a decision to orient our lives to Christ. To take a stand. To say, this is what I believe. And this is what I'm going to center my life around. That story is unique to each and every one of us. But I can tell you this, as I have spoke to, you know, many different groups all over Canada and with individuals in my parish and in my ministry and my friendships, I always would think that I needed to have so much, you know, I needed to know exactly how to say it, how to communicate the faith just perfectly so they could receive it. But every time, it's like the Holy Spirit prompts me and just says, just tell them your story. Tell them your story. You know, more than anything, the people, people need to hear an authentic witness, an authentic telling of God's presence in our lives today that he is active, that he is real, that he is not some distant figure in the clouds that's just playing with our lives. But he is real, that he lives here, that he brings joy beyond comparison. And the thing is, it's not just that initial story. It's not just that initial conversion. I've heard lots of people say, well, I never had that big moment. You know, I never had that experience where it just can't, you know, it was gradual over time. Yes, but you've made decisions over time to orient your life to Christ, right? You made those decisions to say no to things that led you away from him and yes to the things that brought you close, right? You have a wealth of experience when suffering came your way and you were able to walk on water because Christ was with you. When you discerned your vocation, your calling, as you've raised your children and the many experiences that that has brought you, we have many stories that we need to be ready and able to communicate. Because here is the thing. This is the thing, guys. 
The day that we forget our own need for Jesus is the day that we lose our ability to share him with others. When we do not know our own need, when we are not rooted in that deep knowledge that Christ has saved us, that he has given us everything, and that he continues to walk with us day in and day out, when we're not rooted, what do we have to give? What do we have to give? I've been given this amazing opportunity with an organization in Saskatchewan that works with healthcare workers uh, that work in Catholic healthcare facilities. And I, um, along with a few colleagues, get to come in to this group and they have a diverse background. These healthcare workers come from all over, right? Some of them maybe don't believe in God at all. And we get to come in and we get to share about who God is what he's done for us, how our understanding of God relates to our understanding of the human person, and how then that should relate to our ability to care for them in their suffering, how it affects our understanding of healing. And what I have been amazed with is every time I go and I speak to these groups, we have feedback at the end, and the ones that just mean the most are those who say, you know, I'm not a religious person, but today as I heard the stories of the presenters, I thought to myself, maybe I need to reconsider my convictions. Right? Your stories have power to communicate the reality of Christ. Now, like I said, in my ministry, I journey one-on-one -on -one with people in small groups. And if I could today, I would sit with each and every one of you individually, and we'd have a chat. We'd talk about what you're doing, what your struggles are in your ministry, and I would ask you questions about the things that we're talking about today, the, the bulk of our missionary activity. But I can't do that. It's breaking my heart. So I wanted to try and make this talk as much of a conversation as I could. So with each of these lessons, I've put up some questions that I would invite you to take home and reflect upon. Your story is your most powerful tool. So if you want to have some homework, feel free to take a picture of those questions. But I invite you to take this home, pray with it. And then if you're really bold, take these questions to the team that you plug into. You represent a variety of ministries here. Whether you're working for an organization, you're on a parish council, on a baptism prep team, whatever you are doing in ministry, I would encourage you, take these questions back to your team and have a discussion. Go deep with your fellow missionaries. Share your story. Share how and when you chose to orient your life to Christ. And even more importantly, share about how God has been working in your life in the past six months. Because like I said, this isn't just about that initial conversion. It is about the day-to-day, -day, ongoing, how is God working in your life? And we need to be ready and able to communicate that clearly. So your story your story is your, one of your most powerful tools. Second thing I want to share with you this morning is how our motivation. What is motivating you to be missionary, to evangelize? I believe that authentic love must guide our every action. This must guide our every action in ministry. You know, and I remember after that conversion experience and this stirring within me, this desire to go out and share Jesus. Honestly, I think I thought I was Billy Graham. You know, I wanted to get up on the rooftops. I thought, I'm 19 years old. How? How did I not know this? How did I sit in a pew every Sunday and not know this? I just wanted to tell the world. You know, and there was kind of this erratic urgency <laughs> that was compelling me into ministry. But also there was some guilt. There was some guilt that I had squandered what I had been given in my baptism. 
You know, and that's what was motivating me in the beginning when I began to share my faith. And both of those things really made it more about me than it was about the other person. Hey, that was pretty inspiring, wasn't it? Isn't it great, Peter, to see a young person like that who looks like she's 18, although she's right 30 something george was right yeah yeah, yeah. 18, 19, really really being touched by the lord and responding like she did and having the zeal to tell other people about jesus it was it was inspiring it's great to see the lord raising people up like yeah, that very much i mean that's one of the first thoughts that came here's another apostle that jesus is raising up i mean yeah. we do there's a lot in the church to be discouraged about these days lots of people talking about what's not working yeah but we we know from the experience of connecting with young people uh, seeing young people around the country and around the world, the Lord really is raising up young apostles and prophets and evangelists and mm -hmm. pastors and teachers and people yeah. with the gifts the Spirit has given them. Yeah. But what we notice in her story was there was uh, in a moment of, of awakening. There was a time, uh, whether, uh, you know, f the kind of time the Lord wants all of us to be able to, to come to where we encounter Him in a personal way. And it, she made that shift from having inherited the faith mm -hmm. to having encountered a person. And encountering the person of Jesus, you could just tell by the way she talks that she found the treasure hidden in the field. Yeah. Right? The, and yeah. The, the pearl of great price. She, so this is she it. Sell, yeah. I, I didn't know. I didn't know him. Now, that's a gift from God to be able to see it at that level and experience it. Yeah. And her heart fell in love with Christ. That's a, the gift of the Holy Spirit for her working. And it's amazing to see how well she's responded to it. Yeah. And I think what she says is absolutely true. Once you see what the Lord has done for us, how he's given everything i mean like he, he totally poured himself out he was willing to to be crucified he was willing to be mocked he was willing to be rejected he was willing to be spit upon he was willing to be lied about he was willing to be sentenced unjustly for us and once you see what jesus did for us so that we can have our sins forgiven so that we can rise from the dead with him like she said she said you know the only sensible response is to totally give your life back to him. And that's what she did. And that's really what all of us should do. I mean, Jesus has done this for every single one of us. And our response really does need to be giving our whole life back to him. I think the, maybe there's some who are watching or saying, I, I don't know Jesus in that way. I don't know God in that way. And I want you to know, we want you to know that the Lord desires to reveal himself personally to every single person. It's like the special mission of the Holy Spirit is to reveal to every human heart the beauty and the majesty and the love of Jesus Christ. Not that you'll have the same experience she had. Everybody has a different encounter and experience with God. But you can ask, if you're listening today and you long for something like that, just ask the Holy Spirit to please show me the Lord. Help me see Jesus. Help me know his personal love for my life. And, and to make a decision, if you see anything, any obstacles in the way of that, to be able to repent and to get on our knees and say, Lord, I just, I'm sorry for every sin I've ever committed or whatever might be on your mind. And I really desire to know you like that. That's the inheritance of a Christian. Yep. That's what he wants to give to everybody. Yeah, so I think, yeah. That's really true. And like she said, you know, she says some people experience a dramatic experience like Paul or like her in a certain kind of way. Others, it's kind of gradual. And I thought she explained that really well. Didn't yeah. she say, everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a story to tell. You have said no to some things that would have led you away from the Lord. You have said some, young, some things yes to that lead you closer to the Lord. Everybody has a story. And I think her recommendation to everybody that they practice telling their story, thinking about their story, trying to figure out how to express it in a way that connects with people. I think that's a great advice for a simple way of evangelizing. It is. And I think the uh, sometimes people can hesitate and say, well, who wants to know my story? Or my story isn't big enough or good yeah, enough or yeah. doesn't have enough, fire, doesn't have enough. enough fireworks in it, yeah. something like that. Yeah. But that isn't true either. It's what comes from the heart. How has how have you encountered the person of Jesus and how has knowing him made a difference in your life? How have you experienced him concretely answering your prayer, touching your heart, changing your heart, receiving his forgiveness? How has he shown his love to you and your family? I mean, just simple stories like that. Number one, they can't be refuted because they're your story, right? Right. But the real hunger and the point, a good point she made was that most human beings wonder, is, 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 is it possible to know God in a way that's personal mm -hmm. and experiential. Mm -hmm. And it is. And that's where people connect with it. So you don't just communicate the theory. That comes at a certain point when people's hearts are awakened and they want to know more and they have a desire for more. But I think uh, the personal communication is say, well, wow, if God can touch you that way, you know, or your children that way, mm -hmm. he can touch me too yeah. and my children, my family, yeah. right? 
Yeah, and this is something that we do in Renewal Ministries. We often give our testimonies. We right. often tell our stories. This is something I actually do in the seminary with uh, priests and seminarians and lay students. Every single class I run, I have people practice giving their five-minute testimony. We'll do it at the beginning of every class. A different student will get up, and he'll share how he came to experience God as real in his life and and, and what difference that really made. And it's very inspiring, you know. I tell them to practice giving your testimony in a way that fallen away Catholics and unbelievers would understand what you're talking about. So sometimes like a sister or a nun in my class might get up and say, well, then I went to adoration and the monstrance was so beautiful. And I'll say, wait, wait, wait. Non-Catholics and fallen away Catholics may not know what a monstrance is. So go back and right. think about it a little bit more about using language that would show how God became real to you uh, in, in language that people could understand. And it's, it's really, it's very inspiring to see how God works in everybody's life and everybody has a testimony. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing to see how much, if you give it a little thought, yeah. you can get in in three to five minutes yeah. sharing your story with somebody. And so it generally has like three parts. Like, where was my life before I encountered the Lord? Give, give them something that will sort of characterize what your life was like in relationship to God and how you were living. And then when and how did you encounter God? You know, the, what was the point of that change? What was the change like? And then third, what difference has yes. that now made in my life? How am I different now than I used to be? It's that, pretty simple. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. That's exactly it. Just yesterday in class, I had a Chaldean seminarian, a deacon, getting ready to be ordained. You know, Chaldeans are uh, Iraqi Christians who have come to the United States in large numbers. And uh, the biggest Chaldean population outside of Iraq is right here in Michigan. And and th there are wonderful people, aren't they, Peter? And they, they, they have a lot of vocations and they're doing really well. So this Chaldean seminarian, Deacon, was sharing how he was just an ordinary Chaldean man and he was working seven days a week in a party store because the Chaldeans own a lot of the party stores and liquor stores in the Detroit area. And, he, you know, he didn't have any big reason for not going to mass, but he just didn't. He was kind of busy and, you know, like he says, a lot of, like a lot of men, you know, type of thing. And then through a whole series of circumstances, somebody invited him to a Bible study and he became an on fire Chaldean man, you know? And so just inviting people to go to things is really, you know, really important, isn't it? Really, that's one Very much ordinary so. way of evangelizing. Yeah, and it's less complicated and less difficult than it looks, Yeah, you know, when you, before you do it. You yeah. think, oh man, if I do something like this, is anybody gonna come? Is anybody gonna respond to an invitation? Yeah. Am I, are they gonna think I'm being pushy? Don't worry about all that stuff. Because if, if love motivates your heart, the second thing she said, yes. it's, it's love that motivates us, right? The love of Christ compels me, St. Paul said, and it compels us. And as we fall in love with Jesus Christ, as she described in her own life, you become um, which is contagious in a healthy way. You begin to just out of love start spreading the good infection as C.S. Lewis said at one point. And you just do it in simple ways. You notice she said like, I'm a missionary at my kitchen table. Yeah. Like the first disciples are my own children, those that I'm yeah. discipling. And then yeah. friends yeah. and neighbors and things like that over tea, over whatever, to just be able to share from your heart in love. And if you're loving the person who's in front of you, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll sense it, they'll know it. And the greatest gift you can give to somebody is the person of Jesus, his faith, yeah. is the knowledge of Christ, right? It really is, no question about it. And it was actually somebody inviting me on a weekend retreat that honestly saved my life. You know, I was heading in a not a good direction and a friend kept inviting me and I kept saying no. So if somebody you're inviting says no, go back and ask them again and keep at it, you know, sometimes. Didn't he ask you in tears at one point, Ralph, almost yes, like begging yeah, you yeah. to come to this? Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just felt like, oh my God, he really, he really wants me to go and okay, I'm gonna go. And that yeah. I kind of broke, my defenses got broke down because of his persistence and because of his love, you know? And so don't give up if somebody says no the first time. Next time Scott Hahn comes to your parish for a parish retreat, invite people to go, you know? Next time Peter Herbeck comes and gives a talk at your parish, invite people to go. It's a wonderful way of exposing people to the possibility of really discovering Jesus. It was similar in my own life. My sister and then some other ladies who I didn't know, who I got to know, convinced me to come to the University of Notre Dame. That's where I heard you the first time. And then I'll, I'll always be grateful for how personal and present the Lord was on that Sunday morning after communion. I'm standing in, this, in the football stadium and I'm just praying and saying, Lord, I, I don't know you the way these people know you and I want to love you, but I'm a weak guy. I'm a weak man. And without your help, I don't think I can do this. I need faith. And then just an ordinary everyday guy from Indianapolis, Indiana comes and taps me on the shoulder, looks at my name tag and said, Peter, I'm sitting back here a few rows getting ready to go to communion. And when I saw you, son, um, I felt the Holy Spirit 
come to tell, you know, move in me to come and tell you that the faith and love that you seek shall be granted to you because Christ loves you and he's died for you. And now this was just an ordinary guy and, and he had to respond to that little prompting inside him and should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? What if this kid thinks I'm strange or whatever? Yeah. But he acted on it. Yeah. And the Lord's in us and the Lord's in you and he wants to act in you too. You don't have to be Ralph Martin or Scott Hahn. Just because you live with the Lord and you love the Lord, you've got a lot to share and he's going to help you understand what people need as you love them, as you build relationship with them and pray with them. He'll give you insight and it'll help them. Yeah. Christy was speaking to people who are very active in the parish or the church or interested in evangelization, but all of us are called to share with others the faith that the Lord has given us. And so I'd like to encourage you to look for opportunities. Ask the Lord to open your eyes and give you the courage and be sensitive to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit to reach out to people. People need the Lord. Life is chaotic. Life is hopeless. Life is depressing oftentimes without the Lord. So people need the Lord. So you step out and reach out and give him a chance to touch hearts. I've written a booklet called Mary's Mission, Our Response. Mary's mission is the same as Christie's, reaching out to people, trying to be a, a servant of Jesus, trying to be a servant of the Holy Spirit, helping people to come to faith in her beloved son. We'd like to make this booklet available to you just as a, a free gift. So go to our website, renewalministries.net, click on the tab that says free booklet, and we'll get it right out to you. Till next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck urging you, encouraging you, supporting you, and reaching out to others with the message of Jesus. At times of great crisis for the church and for humanity, God has sent a very special messenger. When the new world was not responding to the gospel, he sent Mary at Guadalupe. When atheism was aggressively growing in Europe, he sent Mary at Lourdes, and the living waters began to flow. When perhaps the greatest crisis began to unfold, the domination of the world by an atheistic materialism, which is still growing, he sent Mary at Fatima. The world is again in danger, the church is again confused, and she is here again to help us. I've written a booklet about her and her role and her mission today. We'd like to give it to you at no cost just for the asking. Go to our website, renewalministries.net, and we'll send it right off to you.